So um, I'm going to be talking about the split in the suffrage movement before the war between those who were supporting what was known as the limited suffrage demand, that's votes for women on the same terms as men, and those who believed they should seek universal suffrage, which they always called adult suffrage, and Jill Liddington was talking quite a bit about this. So I'm going to... Can you all hear? Can you hear if I sit down? Sorry. Yes. Um, I'm going to explore some of the dilemmas especially for socialist women, as illuminated by the work of Margaret Llewellyn Davis, who I'm writing a biography of, uh, between 1906 and 1909. I mean, she did a lot more later on, but I'm just focusing on 1906 to 1909. Sorry, 1904 to 1909. And for reasons which will become evident soon, I refer to her throughout as Margaret, rather than Davis. Just going to be easier. She was a socialist and a feminist, and General Secretary of the Women's Cooperative Guild between 1889 and 1921. First of all, I'm going to give a little bit of background about her, the Guild and the suffrage. Then I'll track how she moved from supporting the limited demand in 1904 to adult suffrage in 1909. And I'm drawing on her personal correspondence, papers of the Women's Cooperative Guild, and also the women's pages of the co-op newspaper, the Cooperative News. So a bit of background about Margaret. She was born in 1861 into a family which was very well connected in the liberal intellectual elite of the time. She grew up surrounded by reforming ideas, especially about the advancement of women. Actually, she was the niece of Emily Davis, the feminist pioneer who actually set up Girton. Um, in her privileged world, it was assumed that both men and women could and should intervene in public affairs that they had the right to be listened to, and that they could make things happen. And that was very much what she took on board. As an adult, she became an astute and persuasive campaigner. In fact, her friend Virginia Woolf complained that Margaret could compel a steamroller to waltz. <laughs> she was an ethical socialist, and is said to have joined the ILP, the Independent Labour Party. But she wasn't actually active in any overtly socialist grouping as such. Instead, she, her primary allegiance was to the cooperative movement, which, with its idea of, ideal of eventually transforming society into a cooperative commonwealth, and especially to the Women's Cooperative Guild. She was elected as the Guild's General Secretary in 1889, and from then on it was her lifelong commitment. Its members were mostly home-based wives and mothers from better off sections of the working class, so very different from her. Uh, they'd commonly given up regular paid employment when they married, although a lot of them had worked in the mills from when they were very young. But after they married and had children, they then got taken up with unpaid, often backbreaking labour in the home. Margaret, convinced that Guild's women's voices should be heard both within and outside the cooperative movement, introduced an organised system of education, discussion and campaigning. And the members responded enthusiastically. As one put, put it, from a shy, nervous woman, the Guild made me a fighter. This campaigning approach attracted large numbers of activists in the years leading up to World War I. And by 1914, there were over 32,000 members in 590 odd branches across England and Wales. There was a separate Guild in Scotland. Uh, the Guild by then was widely recognised as a major organisation representing working class women. Importantly, it did have a democratic structure. Although Margaret was its long term leader, she actually was re elected annually and she was responsible to an elected central committee and policy was made at an annual congress. So, just about how she and the Guild approach suffrage. Looking back much later, Margaret affectionately criticised her conservative aunt, Emily Davis, joking that she believed in women's suffrage, more because she thought it in for a dig for an employing lady not to have a vote when her gardener did, than because the vote was for protection from injustice and a weapon for reform. So like the people in the WFL, for Margaret, she saw gaining the vote as a means to an end, not an end point. While she worked hard for suffrage, her overall priority was to further the interests of working class women, especially the married women in the Guild. She pointed out to them that without the vote, campaigning for the legal changes they wanted on things like conditions of work, 
housing, health and education was like trying to move a train by pushing it from behind instead of driving it by steam. So Margaret always juggled suffrage work and her commitments to the Guild and to its other campaigns. So throughout, she also continued to battle for changes within the cooperative movement, for example, for minimum wages for women working as employees in the co-op, and to campaign on other national issues, such as reform of the divorce laws and a major crusade for women to receive state maternity benefit and decent maternity care. So for her, the battle for suffrage was a cause, rather than, as for so many, the cause. Within the Guild, among the, the membership, there were mixed opinions about suffrage. It was always a broad church, containing not only committed activists, but also some women who were not interested in campaigning in, in any way. Others specifically opposed working for suffrage, because they saw it as a, quote, political issue, and cooperators weren't just supposed to discuss religion or <coughs> politics. But that was really meant to be party politics. However, from the late 1890s, an increasing number of members began to support votes for women, and of course the Guild went on to play a significant part in the burgeoning suffragist movement, working successfully with the NUWSS and other groups. However, as you'll see, members didn't always agree about aspects of the campaign. I think that's quite important. They were not a homogenous group. And on occasion, Margaret herself decided to take action as an individual rather than getting the girl's approval. So now I'm going to go on to Margaret's journey from supporting limited to supporting adult suffrage. In 1904, she made her first really significant move to commit the Guild officially to women's suffrage. Jewel Liddington has written brilliantly and also spoke today about the radical suffragist movement in the, among the women workers in the industrial towns of the North. And Guild's women played a leading part in this in the early 1900s, the local Guild's women. Bearing this in mind, and with a private member's suffrage bill due to come before Parliament, it seemed to Margaret a very good time to get a major debate going in the Guild at its annual Congress and to get official approval for suffrage work. But although they did pass a suffrage resolution, there were also some really deep disagreements that came out in the debate. And what was this about? Well, the resolution back votes for women on the same terms as is or may be granted to men. That's a standard limited demand put forward by suffrage campaigners. But of course, as we know, there was a property qualification. Only 60% of men were currently eligible to vote. So as some guilds women angrily pointed out, they were being asked to support votes for better off women, not for all women. There were others, however, including socialists like Sarah Reddish, whose name you probably know, um, who supported limited reform as a first step towards getting votes for all women. And Margaret herself took this line. She claimed that in the current political climate, it was less risky to do that, to go for limited, than to go straight for adult suffrage. She argued that if they could get a limited bill passed initially, votes for all women would almost certainly be included when votes for all men came up later. And she was feared that if instead an adult suffrage bill came, f came up first, it was likely that, quotes, opposition to the enfranchisement of women would lead to the passing of manhood suffrage only. And these disagreements reflected wider divisions which were coming up in the labour movement at the time. Many Labour men, and indeed some women, I think Hannam and Hunt discussed this, were convinced that middle-class women's suffrage campaigners, like Emily Davis, only wanted votes for women like themselves. In their turn, women's suffrage supporters often feared that Labour activists for adult suffrage were really only concerned with votes for men, especially as the government was much more likely to give this than votes for women. It was much more of a political possibility. There was no doubt some truth in both of these uh, uh, accusations. Well, the dispo dispute boiled up in the run-up to a Labour representation committee, uh, which became the Labour Party, to its conference in January 1905, <coughs> where they were going to decide about supporting the limited suffrage bill. And Margaret worked with the radical suffragists on a compromised form of words to try to persuade them. 
she put a guild statement in the Socialist Clarion newspaper, committing the guild to what she now called womanhood, in brackets, or adults, <laughs> close brackets, <laughs> suffrage. A bit long-winded, but you get the point. And the statement also confirmed that the guild would support any bill which would not exclude married women and which would include a large proportion of working women, so that she was keeping her options open there. And this was printed alongside a very similar piece from the radical suffragists, also referring to women, womanhood suffrage, which wasn't a term I think that was used much before. By introducing this term, they hoped to link votes for women firmly with the adult suffrage demands, but also to suggest, as Margaret believed at this stage, that many working class women could in fact benefit from limited suffrage reform. Of course, what happened was that they didn't win, and the LRC actually voted against supporting the limited bill and committed itself to adult suffrage only. And this confirmed the distance, the gap between the Labour Party and the suffrage movement, which continued until what Jill Liddington was talking about in 1911-1912, when they came together. So that was Margaret's initial position. Meanwhile, with a mandate from the Congress, Margaret and the Guild put their full weight behind votes for women, and from now onward, Guild's women marched, protested, and organised alongside other suffragists, working particularly closely in the North with the radical suffragists, because they were very much some of them the same people. And Margaret herself prepared a united manifesto for the 1906 general election and got support from a range of suffrage groups, the Women's Liberal Federation and some trade unions. She was trying to bring them together. But then in December 1906, working with two close women friends, she did something quite unexpected. The Liberals' recent landslide victory in the general election made it seem much more likely than before that a limited suffrage bill might actually get through. She was worried about this, and she wrote to the press asking suffrage organisations to back a proposal to adapt the limited demand, in fact to extend it to give the vote to married women on the basis of their husband's qualifications. And that might seem to single out married women for preferential treatment, but in fact it wasn't so. Currently a man could vote if he owned or occupied property, but stimulated perhaps by points that Gill's women had made in the debates. Margaret argued that even if votes for women were granted on these terms, a married woman would not quote, qualify. Instead, her husband would count as the householder. I think there's some disagreement about whether that in fact was going to be the case then and now. Anyway, whatever the, uh, that, uh, the major suffrage organisations roundly rejected her proposal, although she did persuade a sympathetic MP to include it in a bill. Later, she and her friends acknowledged that this had been a hasty and, to be honest, a bit botched compromise. Concerned that a limited bill was going to be introduced, they had, as they said, deferred to the prejudice against asking for adult suffrage by coming up with a formulation which they hoped could be incorporated into a limited framework. Again, trying to sort of bridge the gap. However, it didn't work, as we know, and Margaret, in any case, was swiftly moving on in her thinking. Within months, she wrote to her good friend Bertrand Russell, who was on the executive of the NUWSS. The limited bills belong to another regime and other conditions. Opinion among Liberal MPs was now moving towards adult suffrage, she claimed. And if women successfully lobbied for, limit, lobbied for limited reform now, it would actually be a stumbling block. Then, of course, the situation changed in 1908 when Asquith, who, as we know, was fiercely anti-women's suffrage, <coughs> promised to bring in a bill to enfranchise men only. When a Liberal MP tested the government's attitude with a private member's bill, for, basically for adult suffrage, Margaret again took action in a personal capacity. She persuaded 23 women, mostly prominent socialists and trade unionists, to sign an open letter welcoming the bill. This came out, it duly came out in the Times, but it was next to another letter from Millicent Fawcett of the NUWSS opposing the bill. Not for the first time, Margaret and the NUSS were at odds. However, she was developing alliances with Labour women. By now, Margaret had changed her position irrevocably and was a convinced adultist. 
Later in 1909, again in a personal capacity, she played a key role in launching a new organisation, the People's Suffrage Federation, the PSF, which promoted adult suffrage with the simple slogan, one man, one vote, one woman, one vote. In a conciliatory letter to the Common Cause, the suffragist paper, Margaret explained that the PSF's aim was to, quote, combine the splendid uprising of women against their subordinate position with the democratic demand that suffrage should be placed on a human and not a property basis. She claimed that a majority of liberals were now opposed to the limited demand and that the idea of broader electoral reform was widely accepted. <coughs> so the PSF hoped to unite the mainstream women's suffrage groups with uh, adult suffrage supporters in the Labour movement and especially with Labour MPs. However, although some individual suffragists joined the PSF, the suffrage leadership was again implacably opposed. The PSF did successfully gather support among Liberal MPs and in other Liberal quarters, and from the outset it had very strong Labour links. So Margaret shared the job of on secretary with Mary MacArthur, a trade unionist and ILP activist, and Arthur <coughs> Henderson, chair of the Parliamentary Labour Party, was the treasurer. And although the socialist-oriented adult suffrage society rejected the PSF, its one-time chair, Margaret Bondfield, joined and became chair of the PSF executive committee. <coughs> there was, however, friction when it came to getting guild support, and the 1909 Guild Congress only narrowly passed an adult suffrage resolution. There was continuing angry opposition to this change in policy being <coughs> limited to adults, and in the end, Margaret could not bring the whole organisation into, into the PSF, though the cent Central Committee and some branches affiliated. Really, what was going on was a split within the Guild. It wasn't that they were, they were all against Margaret, it's that there was a strong adult current and a strong current that still believed in the limited group. So, in conclusion, despite the bitterness associated with the debates around adult suffrage, Margaret's journey, in my view, illustrates how it could be an issue of tactics rather than principle. She was always a convinced supporter of adult suffrage, but also a pragmatic campaigner. And she based her decisions on what she thought was possible at a given time. It's perhaps worth noting that the radical suffragists, who were also an organisation of working class women, stayed with the limited demand and did not follow her particular trajectory. Indeed, Sarah Reddish, who was a, not both a, guild, a leading guildswoman and a radical suffrage leader, um, she actually opposed Margaret's change in the debates in 1909. So it wasn't automatic that socialist women moved over to the adult suffrage uh, cause in the way that Margaret did, but she, I think, does provide an interesting illustration. Thank you.